Approaching the ancient landmark with Jared Jacobs. Tune in each week as we study God's Word together. Welcome to this another edition of the Ancient Landmark. My name is Jared Jacobs. I'm so thankful to be with you. We might once again open up God's Word. We might spend time in the study of the Book of God. You have this opportunity to go ahead and get a Bible. I wish you would. Go ahead and get a Bible out and follow along with the things we're going to study. If we spend time in the book of God. I wonder if you've ever thought the question, uh, uh, thought from God's aspect to ask him, how have you loved us? To think about God, oftentimes people will say, how has God loved us? To what extent has God loved us? Does he love us at all? Has he stopped loving us? All those questions come up from time to time, don't they? All those questions come forth, uh, and, and they're born sometimes from a heart of sadness. They're born sometimes from a heart of frustration. Sometimes they're born from the heart of ignorance. But whatever the case may be, folks oftentimes ask that question. And in fact, it's not uncommon. We find it in the book of Malachi. If you go back in your Bibles in the Old Testament to the book of Malachi, it's the last book of the Bible. If you have trouble finding that, go to Matthew and just turn back one. Malachi chapter 1. And there, beginning in verse 2, is talking about God's people. It's talking about the Israelites, who at this time, the Bible says, uh, that Malachi was writing to them the burden of the word of the Lord. It says to Israel, verse 1, by Malachi. Verse 2, I have loved you, saith the Lord. Yet ye say, wherein has God loved us, or how has God loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob. And I hated Esau, and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Whereas Edom saith, We are impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall build, but I will throw down. They, and they shall call them the border of wickedness, and the people against whom the Lord hath indignation forever. And your eyes shall see, and you shall say, The Lord will be magnified from the border of Israel. If you look in those few verses of Malachi chapter 1, you'll see a time when God's own people were asking to God, How have you loved us? That's exactly what's being said here. God said, I loved you. But you said, How have you loved us? As you continue to read, God answers the question. He says, Here's how I have loved you. He says, Well, what about Esau? Or Edom, the nation of Edom. What about Esau? He says, I love Jacob. I hated Esau. I've laid his mountains and his heritage to waste. And Edom said, We are impoverished, but we will return and build again. But thus saith the Lord, They shall build, but I will throw down. Notice that. He says, They, will, they said, I will build. But God said, I will throw you down. You're going to know that I love you, the Lord says, because you'll see how that I have executed my judgment against the nation of Edom, or, or of the nation of the descendants of Esau. You're going to see how I have executed this judgment against them, God says, while I have preserved and have kept you. And throughout the book of Malachi, it becomes abundantly clear just how it is that God has loved his people. You see it over and over again. And that's why I asked the question at the beginning. If you have ever asked that question of God, how have you loved me? Whether it's of anger or frustration or confusion or whatever the case may be, and someone wonders just how has God loved us? Have we ever talked like that? Have we ever let the outward circumstances of life so uh, affect us as we would wonder and question even God's love? You know, that's not the only time that has happened. If you turn in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 73, in Psalm 73, we will read about a time wherein that happened uh, there. In the book of Psalms, in the 73rd Psalm, we're, we'll see this. The Bible says at this time that Asaph, Asaph was one who was concerned about this, and he said in verse 1, Psalm 73, he said, Truly God is good to Israel even as such as ever a clean heart. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. And the reason was because he was envious of the foolish. He was envious of the wicked people 
and what they had done, it seemed like they were getting away with everything. It seemed like they had no problems, no issues, or anything like that. And as he come down here in Psalm 73 and continue to read, he comes to the point here where he says all day long, he said, I have been plagued, I have washed my hands in innocency. But if I say, verse 15, if I say and I speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. In other words, he says, I was thinking, how does God love me? How is it that God can allow these things to go on? How can God allow these things to happen and seemingly let everyone get away with, with their sin, with their wrongdoing? How can this happen? And he says, I just about gave up altogether. And even asking these questions, he said, I was afraid to admit it out loud. I was afraid to say anything out loud, though, at this time. Have you ever been that way? Have you ever thought these thoughts and was concerned about this, but then you said, you know, I'm afraid to say something out loud. I'm afraid even to admit it. I'm afraid to say it because of perhaps how people will look at me, what people will think of me. Uh, perhaps you're worried because you said, I don't know, you know, I might cause someone else to be offended or cause someone else to sin, whatever the case may be, and you were concerned about it. Let me assure you, in no uncertain terms, that God has loved us. How has God loved us? As you look into the Bible, we will see this answer made abundantly clear. How have you loved us? God answers that question in a number of ways. First of all, we ask the question, how have you loved us? God answers us. And we see it, first of all, in the creation, in our physical blessings. I start here because really this is the basis of it all. If we cannot show and prove that God's love is in the creation, then really there's no point in going on because God created us because He wanted us. And in our creation, he has made us so that we can be saved from our sins. He has provided not only with the physical life and physical blessings, but also spiritual things. But the point being, we cannot enjoy the, the spiritual things had we not first been born or first been brought into this world physically. And so God has made us. You see, if there's no creation, then it is an absolute fact you're not loved. If there's no creation, folks, there is no love. And this is where so many of the evolutionists and all that, so many of them just miss it. This is where they have a real problem because they basically have us here due to a cosmic accident. I mean, that's what they say. They say, you know, back about six billion years ago, there was a cosmic accident wherein atoms and, and all of this accidentally exploded and accidentally divided themselves and accidentally began this great explosion which spread out throughout all the, at, at that time, a vacuum, but spreading out farther and farther into the known universe of what will become. And as a result of this, after so long of a time, clouds were formed and then planets were formed and all of this, and here after a time upon this planet, as there was chaos and there was ruin and everything else, and no life, no nothing, but finally there were amino acids and all of that, then they accidentally got together and they accidentally combined into one another and created a cell based on the, the acid and based on the organic soup, as it's often called, and based on the power source, perhaps a lightning bolt, they don't know, they, they want to tell you that, but whatever it was, and boom, here's a cell. And from that cell, and that cell was there for however long, and then after a time it accidentally divided itself and became a dual cell. And then after a time that cell continued to divide and divide and divide until we have uh, all phases and forms and grades of life where you have male and female, you have plant cell, animal cell, you have all those things, and all of it's come from this. All of it has come as an accident. We're nothing more than cosmic accident. Well, folks, listen. If we're here by an accident, if we are here based on the fact that, that it just so happened, and things just happened to fall into place, and it was all an accident, no creator, no God, no love, no nothing, if that's the case, then everyone is a mutant. 
How you like that, you mutant? Because that's what you'd be. You were a mutant. You were a mutated form. You were a mutated way of life and all of that because you accidentally, because that cell accidentally divided and then accidentally became something else and something else. And back during the, in the theory of, of evolution suggests that mutations that were made back all those many years ago, supposedly, why those things actually enhanced life and made things better. So we brought it down to present day. Well, anytime I know about a mutant, anytime I know about mutated genes or mutated, uh, you know, life forms, they are not for the benefit, but they are for the worse. And oftentimes, on top of that, sterile. And you're trying to tell me that we came from a mutant, mutated genes and mutated forms of life till we are here at this point? It doesn't make sense, does it? But I want to tell you something. If all of that would be true, then truly we are not loved. There is no love. There's no point in being here. There's no purpose for being here and purpose in this life. There's no love. There's no caring. There's no anything. We're just here by an accident. You see the problem here? You see what has happened? And what we find rather it is just the opposite. And you look around and you say, well, if, if evolution was so true, why can't we find it on any other planet? Why can't we? We've, we've shot rockets and we've shot telescopes and we've shot everything else out in all the various places we could go out in the galaxy and beyond and looking for these various things. Somebody says, well, just give us enough time and we'll find it. Yes, and that's what you've said about the evolutionary theory. Just give them enough time and they'll figure it out. And they've already pushed it back to six billion years. And before long, someone will shoot it past that and go back farther than that. Just give them enough time. You know, just give them enough time, they'll find a life form, I'm sure. But think about that. The truth is this. The truth is that God created us. You look back in the book of Genesis in chapter 1, and the Bible gives us our origin. He gives us the origin of our life. The origin of this earth, the origin of plant life, the origin of animal life, the origin of human life. It is all given to us right there in the book of Genesis in chapter 1. Wherein God says, it says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning God brought all these things into being. When he called forth and said, let there be light. And there was light. When he separated the light from the darkness. When God himself called forth and created all manner of life, the habitat in which we live, and then all manner of life is brought in where it says that they brought forth after their kind. A kind begets the same kind. Now that's not something that was just an accident. That's not something that just happened. That was God's intention and purpose. That the same, uh, that like begets like. The same uh, animal is going to beget or reproduce the same animal. The same plant life is going to reproduce the same plant life. That's the way God made us. That's what God has done for us. He made man, finally, in Genesis 1, verse 26. He says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. He says there uh, that God made them and to have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. God made man in his image. You talk about love. You talk about caring. You talk about someone who has, has looked ahead and looked forward and down the stream of time and decided how he wants things done. It is the God of heaven that has done that. It is the God of heaven that has created these very things. So much so that by Revelation 4 and verse 11, you jump from Genesis to Revelation. Revelation 4 and verse 11 says that for thy pleasure they are and were created. In other words, God made us because he wanted us. That's why he, we are here. We are here because God wanted us. Again, in the book of Acts 17. In Acts 17 and the verses number 24, we read about the apostle Paul when he went to Mars Hill there in Athens. And there as he preached and as he taught to the Athenians in Acts chapter 17, he began by saying, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. 
neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing that he giveth them all life and breath and all things, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell upon all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation. He says that they should seek after the Lord, lest if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Even as some of your own poets have said, we are also his offspring. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not think that the Godhead is likened to gold, silver, uh, it says, or stone graven by art and man's devices. And so here is God. And it says that he is not like gold, silver, stone, and that kind of thing. But there is a living and true God in heaven who has made us. And he made all nations of men for to dwell upon all the face of the earth. He hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. The very fact that we could live and was told by in Genesis 1 to, to go and to fill all the earth and to scatter and, and fill all the earth all around. That is God's determination. That is God's will. And folks have been doing that since Genesis 11 and have continued to do so ever since. Now think about that. What kind of love is this? What kind of love is it for one to create, but not merely to create, also to sustain that creation. In Him we live and move and have our being. It is God who sustains us. That's why I said in, in, at this point, that's why I said in, in making this point, that God showed His love through the creation and physical blessings. Because the physical blessings of, a, of an earth that produces uh, plant life, that produces so we can grow our vegetables and grow our crops. An earth that, that sustains water and sustains life, that pours out its rain upon us, and the, the beauties of nature all around us, and, and all of those things that come, and a universe and a galaxy all that gives us, the, uh, such as the sun that warms us, and, and all the many wonderful blessings has come from a God of heaven. That's the point. See that? Somebody says, how have you loved us, God? Remember, that's the question. Somebody says, how have you loved us? And God answers and says, I love you because I created you, and I continue to bless you. That's what God says. That's how He has loved us. But it's more than that. It's more than just saying, how have you loved us and it's a, a, from a physical standpoint. But in fact, as we continue, we see in our Bibles the plan of salvation unfolding. You know, that's the theme of the Bible. The theme of the Bible is redemption. Many times people have a mistaken idea about the Bible because they think that, well, if I have any question under the sun, then I'll just go to a passage and open it up and read it, and there it is. The Bible is not, the Bible is not the unabridged history of the world. That's not what this Bible is. This Bible is not just a great big history book that tells you every single thing that ever happened to anybody, you know, for the past, you know, 4,000 some years that it covers. That's not what's going on. But in fact, what the Bible talks about is its theme of redemption, of salvation. And so whenever I open up the Bible and begin to read, what I'm reading about is a plan of salvation by which all men can be saved. All men can be redeemed. They can all be right. We can all be right in the sight of God. That's the purpose of this book. Now, it follows the course or follows a, a, a lineage all right. It follows a specific family down through the years. And their children, grandchildren, great, 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 great grandchildren, and on down through. But all of that is not the unabridged history of the world. But what we see is a plan of salvation that unfolds. You see, not long after God created man, we find that man sinned. You go in Genesis chapter 3, and the first six verses, and there you're going to read about how Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden for a time. But it was Satan who came and he tempted Eve. And as he talked to her, he said, Has God said you can't eat of any tree in this garden? And she said, Well, no, of any tree of the garden we can eat except this one we cannot eat of. 
And she'd say, We shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Satan lied to her, saying, You shall not surely die. He said, in fact, God knows that in the day you eat thereof, your eyes will be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and tree desires to make one wise, she took it and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. And the Bible says because of that, those people sinned. Sin was brought into the world because of that, of, of that act, and since that time we have been living with the physical consequences of sin, for sure, and more on that in a moment. But we've been living with these problems ever since. Now God said in Genesis chapter 3, as He confronted Adam and Eve and the serpent for that matter, as He confronted them, He speaks to the serpent in Genesis 3 verse 15 and tells him, I'm going to put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, thou shalt bruise his heel. Now we understand, just hold your finger right there, we understand that Revelation 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. We see how this comes about and how this is unfolding right here. Starting in Genesis chapter 3, we're reading about how God's plan of salvation unfolds all the way through history. And so it begins right there in Genesis 3, but it doesn't stop there. As you continue to read and you continue to study, what, we're, what we read about is how that there were those called the sons of God. Now it was not angels. Uh, sons of God meant they were followers of God. And it goes back to the last part of Genesis 4 with Seth, Adam and Eve's boy Seth, and his lineage, how they served and followed the God of heaven. You come down, though, and what had happened was the sons of God, that Seth's lineage, got to marrying Cain's, the, they're the sons of men, or the daughters of men, rather. And so the sons of God married the daughters of men, that Seth's children and lineage, marrying and intermarrying with Cain's lineage, and they end up having children and all of this, obviously, and it ends up with wickedness, evil, and all kinds of ungodly behavior all over the world. So much so that God said, I'm going to, I repent that I've made man, and I'm going to destroy him. But then the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 9, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. So you look in Genesis 6 verses 8 and 9, and you're going to read about Noah finding grace in the eyes of the Lord, and how that he was faithful, how that he was strong and true and faithful to God, so much so that God chooses Noah and his wife, their three sons and their wives, to be those who would go upon the ark, and that from those eight souls, 1 Peter 3 verse 20, from them eight souls are saved by water. These eight souls will then come off the ark. Having come off the ark, the Bible says, then they would repopulate the land, repopulate the world. And that's exactly what happened there at that time. And then we follow through with their, their lineage and their family for a time till you get to Abraham. Abraham, God chooses and says, through your seed, Abraham, through your seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. And that's exactly what happened as by and through his lineage would finally come Christ one day. But God had chosen him, and God gives Abraham three promises, a land promise, a seed promise, and a nation promise. He shows him the land there of Canaan, tells him to walk up and down it, go to and fro. He said, this land is yours. He said, but you can't have it now. But in the fourth generation, <coughs> you can have this land, Genesis 15. The negative of the Amorites is not yet full, but in the fourth generation they shall return and they shall come back and they shall have this land. And sure enough, by the time you, they leave Egypt, wander in the wilderness, and come in under the leadership of Joshua, by the end of the book of Joshua, the Bible says that the Lord gave them all the land which he swore to give them. He says there fell not, ought not one of the promises God made. There was a land promise fulfilled. In the meantime, there was a nation promise fulfilled because these people, these children, 
that became began with Abraham and Sarah, then Isaac. Isaac married Rebekah. They too had Jacob and Esau. From Jacob, Jacob married uh, Jacob married Rachel and Leah. And through them came the twelve sons of Israel. These twelve grew into about seventy there toward the end of the book of Genesis. And by the time they leave Egyptian captivity, they number well over two million. And now leaving this nation of people, enters the land, enters the land of Canaan, there to set up and be in the promised land. The land promise is fulfilled, the seed promise is fulfilled. That just leaves one more promise. Just leaves one more promise to fulfill. He said, through your seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. And Galatians 3 verse 19 says that through thy seed, he says not of seeds as of many, but to thy seed which is Christ. Jesus Christ is the seed, the fulfillment of the seed promise. And that Galatians 4 verses 4 and 5 that says that God there brought Christ into this world. He said made of a woman, made under the law. But what he said before that was in the fullness of time this came about. In the fullness of time when it was the right time. So here's the unfolding of God's plan all the way through from the days of Genesis and unfolding and unfolding and unfolding finally bringing us to Christ so that by and through Christ all nations of the earth can be blessed that we can be the sons of God, we can be in Christ and put on Christ, Galatians chapter 3 says, in verse 27, those who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And he says there that because of this, that if you're Christ, verse 29, if you're Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. There's that promise again. And so now we see this unfold. Somebody says, how have you loved us, Lord? How have you loved us? And God says, I have been patient in making a way by which you can be saved from your sin, freed from the curse which brought so much evil into this world. God says, I love you to that degree. I have saved you from your sin. I have made a way by which you can come and be right with me. I have laid this out and it has unfolded and unfolded throughout the scheme of time, throughout all the years, till Christ would come in the fullness of time. That's what he's done. You talk about something wonderful and grand, folks. Right here it is. A great and wonderful thing. How have you loved us? He created us. How have you loved us? He says, I have unfolded this plan of salvation. We're going to take a break. And after this break, come back and stay with us because we're going to continue to see how God has loved us on down through time up to the present generation. So you stay with us and we'll continue this study and see just how God has loved us very much. You're watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs. Write us at 2920 New Hartford Road, Orangeboro, Kentucky, 42303. Visit our webpage at www.southside-churchofchrist.com Join us on Sunday morning for Bible class at 9.30 and Sunday morning worship at 10.20, Sunday afternoon at 5 p.m. Wednesday night Bible classes for all ages at 7 p.m. Write to us for a free correspondence course. And or a subscription to The Old Pass, our teaching bulletin. Tune into our radio program, What is Written, from 12.30 to 1 p.m. Sunday on 94.7 WBIO. And continue to watch The Ancient Landmark on Monday at 9 p.m., Wednesday at 5 p.m., or Thursday at 11 p.m.
back again. I want to continue in this study concerning the question, asking the question, how have you loved us? And then we noticed just a moment ago how that God has shown his love for us, first of all, through creation, through the physical blessings, also through the unfolding of the plan of salvation. How that God made it clear to, to his people and to us as well that he wants us to be saved and so has unfolded that plan of salvation down through the years, down to, of course, down to the time of Christ. And then even today, we can have salvation because of what has happened, because of God's plan, because of God's purpose, we can have salvation today. And so what I, what I want us to do now is dig in a little deeper into Christ himself. Because what we see in Christ is the focus of that salvation. All the promises, all the prophecies, all the sacrifices, all everything we find in Old Testament days, all pointed to Christ. And you look at any of those uh, sacrifices, where you have the sacrifice of the Lamb, and of course various sacrifices that went with that, we're talking about Christ. When we talk about the prophecies from Genesis 3.15 forward, we're talking about Christ, where there Satan was told in Genesis 3 and verse 15, God said to him, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Notice here he says, I'm going to put enmity, separation between you and the woman, between thy seed and her seed. You know, seed in the Bible, in any other place, seed in the Bible is always on the male side. It's the male that has the seed. And so it talks about, you know, this father begat so-and-so, and this one begat so-and-so, and all that. But it's always on the male side that you have the seed. But in this case, in Genesis 3.15, he says it's going to be her seed. Hers. Why? Well, because when we look to Matthew chapter 1, or you look to Luke chapter uh, 2, 1 and 2 really, but chapter 1 of, of the book of Luke, and then the fulfillment in chapter 2, we see where Mary was chosen and how that she carried Christ. He said and promised that the Holy Spirit would come upon you, would overwhelm you, is the promise of Luke chapter 1. And as a result of the Spirit planted there uh, with the impregnation which took place upon her seed, uh, there, if you, as you, if you will, that it is here Mary, uh, her virgin uh, uh, conception and the birth of Christ coming because it's on her seed, on her side of things. And so that's where that comes from. So from Genesis chapter 3, all the way forward in time, to the time of Christ, we see all the prophecies, all the promises, all the sacrifices and all, looking to Christ. It is in Christ that even the Old Testament itself is fulfilled. In Matthew 5 and verse 17, Jesus spoke to his followers at that time, and those are all gathered around there on the, on the, at the Sermon on the Mount. Not only of his own followers, but, but others as well, and even Pharisees gathered. We see in Matthew 5, 17, Jesus making the promise. He said, I did not come to destroy the law. He said, I came to fulfill. The word fulfill in Matthew 5, 17 means to fill it full, to fill it up, to fill it to its completion. He said, I didn't come to destroy it. I came to fulfill it. And whenever Christ fulfilled everything, there wasn't anything left to do. When he fulfilled that Old Testament law, there wasn't anything left uh, hanging. There wasn't anything left for today. We're not waiting on something else to happen. Now, you know, a lot of folks will tell you that, and they'll say, that, well, you know, we're waiting on the kingdom to come. We're waiting on thus and so. That's not true. It's not found in the Bible at all. It, we're not waiting on the kingdom to come. Jesus brought and instituted his kingdom and he made it possible before he left the earth. And we can be a part of his kingdom today. Colossians 1 verse 13 says so. We can be transferred, translated into the kingdom of his dear son. John said in Revelation chapter 1 that he was in the kingdom. And we find many other uh, references to the kingdom. And so don't be fooled into thinking by some, or don't be fooled in, into listening to the false doctrine that says the kingdom hadn't come yet because it's just not so. Jesus fulfilled. He fulfilled every bit of the Old Testament, every bit and all of it, 
And so there's nothing left for him to do. Whenever Christ returns the second time, he's going to return. He's going to bring uh, his own, his children. He's going to bring those saved people and bring them up to heaven. At the same time, those who are, who are not his children, those, it says, who did not obey the word of God, they didn't follow the word, 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 6 to 9, they will be destroyed and they're cast into a devil's hell. He says they will, Jesus Christ will come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And so whenever Christ comes in, vengeance on those, they're going to be lost in the devil's hell, while at the same time, those who are, uh, who are his children, those who are, uh, belong to him, those folks will be taken and gathered up together in the clouds, he says, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 17, and verse 18 says, Wherefore comfort one another with these words. Those are words of comfort. Because Jesus Christ is the focus of salvation. We find this all the way through. It is God's love seen. How have you loved us? Look at Christ. It's God's love seen at every point, isn't it? John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 5 and verse 8, it said, God committeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When you turn your attention to 1 John chapter 4, we'll learn in no uncertain terms that God is love. Well, if God is love, then we can see just how have you loved us? God, by your very being, you love us. But you look to Christ as the focus of salvation. And we see how that Jesus Christ is this integral part all the way through Scripture, all the way through the Old Testament days, the Old Testament prophecies and words, all pointed to him. You go into the New Testament times from the book of Acts and all the epistles and all those writings and all those things pointed back to him. And so the Old Testament pointed toward him forward in time from the book of Acts and on to the book of Revelation pointed back in time to Christ. All there Christ, the point, uh, the focal point of all salvation. That's the point. See that? His coming into this world, His enduring of the cross, His uh, entire life purpose. What was the entire life purpose but to fulfill the commands of God and to show His love toward us? Say, so you ask the question. You ask the question, how have you loved us, God? How has this been done? How can we see the love? And God answers, and God says in Malachi's day, I promised a Savior to come. And he says, now, you see that same Savior today when you follow my plan of salvation. God tells us just how he loves us. And you can look no farther than Christ and you see his great love. Yes, my friend. When you look around, and you might ask that question sometimes, and you may be in the pits of despair, and you may be in frustration, and you may be in sorrow and hurt and heartache, and you may say, God, how can you love me? How did you love me? Maybe someone sees themselves, and they see themselves as a sinner, and they say, God, I know and realize that you could love me at one point, but I don't know how in the world you could love me now. I'm a sinner, and I'm wicked and, and evil and everything else. And God says, I still love you. I show my love toward you because I sent my own son to die. And whenever Jesus Christ died, he died and shed his blood for every man. Every man, woman, child, and all. And so here's where God's love is seen once more. You see it right there in the scripture, folks. How have you loved us? I loved you through sending my son. I loved you through Christ the Savior. That's the truth. So if somebody says, well, how have you loved us? How can we see this love? Could I suggest to you also that the love of God is seen by the spiritual blessings that God gives. If you turn in your Bible to Ephesians 1 and the verse is number 3, you'll see in the very first, the very beginning parts of this letter to the Ephesian Christians, here's what it says, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in 
Christ. He blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. The question is, how do you get into Christ? Whenever I figure out how I get into Christ, then I will know and I will be a recipient of the blessings, spiritual blessings, that come from God, that show His love for me. How do you get into Christ? Well, you get into Christ, the Bible says, by being baptized into it. He says here in the book of Romans chapter 6, for instance, verses 3 to 6, that we are baptized into Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27 says the same thing. When you're baptized into Christ, he says you put on Christ. Unless you're baptized into him, you can't put him on. But he says you're baptized into Christ. As far as many of you as have been baptized into Christ, he said, have put on Christ. And so I need to be baptized into him. And whenever I'm baptized in two Christ, now we can have those blessings because the spiritual blessings come in Christ. That's why I'm saying that. And no, we understand it's not baptism only. It's not just saying, well, you be baptized and just go find some water and be baptized. No, it's based upon my faith in Christ. It's based upon my repentance, my confession of my faith, and being then being baptized for the remission of my sins, as is revealed in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 2 where we read these very things taking place and about 3,000 being saved at that time because they followed the plan of salvation. Now whenever I do that, then I can have the blessings, spiritual blessings that belong to those in Christ, which includes, by the way, wearing His name. If you go back to Isaiah 56 and verse 5, Isaiah 62 and verse 2, Isaiah 65 and verse 15. Three verses, three passages that speak of a promise of the Lord naming His people. That He is going to name His people one day with a name that's better than sons of daughters. With a name that is an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. With a name that belongs to Him, the name that the mouth of the Lord shall name. That's what's promised. And you look into the New Testament and you see the fulfillment of that very thing. In Acts 11 and verse 26, it says there, the last part of verse 26 of Acts chapter 11, it says the disciples were called Christians. First at Antioch, the disciples were called. That phrase, were called, two words in the English, is one word in the Greek, one word in the original. And those two words uh, form the one word in the original it's called krematizo. That's what was the way you would pronounce that, krematizo. And it meant divinely called of God. So the, here are the Christians, here are the disciples who were divinely called Christians. First the Daniel, the name that is, remember, the name that's better than his sons and daughters, a name that is an everlasting name, a name that the Lord shall name, is found in Acts 11.26. And it goes on to say, 1 Peter 4 and verse 16, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this name. So, if you, glorify, if you are uh, persecuted, if anyone suffers as a Christian, not suffering as a busy, busybody, or as an evildoer, or meddling other men's matters, and, and that kind of thing, or a thief, but he says to suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this behalf or in this name. So, here's God once more giving us the spiritual blessings, giving you a spiritual blessing of a name. A name that you can wear. A name that the world itself cannot wear. Not everyone in the world can wear this name. I know they claim to, and people claim to be Christians, and they'll use that word, that word Christian, and name Christian is used by folks very loosely, sadly, is the case. But when I look into the New Testament, and I read about folks being uh, Christians. It is those who have followed that plan of salvation we've discussed through faith, repentance, and baptism so they can wear the name of Christ. Now that is one of many spiritual blessings that come from God. That's a spiritual blessing we need to appreciate. But I'll tell you something else. What is a spiritual blessing that comes from God? It's the gift of the Holy Spirit. In the book of Acts chapter 2, you remember we've studied this in, for, uh, on several occasions, but in Acts chapter 2, you look there at the very first uh, sermon there on the day of Pentecost. We read where the people are told about Jesus Christ, 
They're told about the death and burial and resurrection of our Lord. They're taught and told just what is necessary to be right in the sight of God. And hearing these words, they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 37. Verse 38, the answer comes back to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins. Ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Verse 39, For the promise is unto you, to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. With many other words did he both testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day they were added to them about 3,000 souls. But you look there in verse 38, and he says that these people, he says, to them, if you repent and be baptized for the remission of your sins, you should receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, folks, that's a spiritual blessing. And we need to appreciate that because there's a world of people today that misunderstand that verse. They misunderstand it and think that what he has promised there is the Holy Spirit. And that's not what he promised at all. The gift of the Holy Spirit. He promises the gift of the Holy Spirit. He wasn't promising the Holy Spirit. He's promising the Holy Spirit's gift. When you say the gift of, the word of shows possession. The gift of, possessed by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit's gift. That's promise. Not, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. If he's going to say, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit, he'd have said it another way. It's like saying, like someone giving you a present. And they say, well, what is this? Well, this is the gift of Timoth, of Tim's. Or this is the gift of Job's. This is the gift of, you know, whoever. This is the gift of Mom. Well, you don't mean that Mom was the gift. You mean Mom gave you a gift. You don't mean that Tim is the gift. Tim gave you a gift. And again, in our English, uh, our English today uh, of the 21st century, we don't say gift of. We would say, you know, Tim's gift. We would say John's gift, whatever. We would say mom's gift. <coughs> well, in those days, they didn't use that term, but they would use this term as it was translated into English. And it was translated the gift of the Holy Spirit. It didn't mean Holy Spirit. Uh, it didn't mean the Holy Spirit was the gift, but the gift that is belongs to the Holy Spirit and given to you. That's all that means. That's all that's about. And people get this so wrangled up and messed up whenever it's very simple. It, well, so what is the gift of the Holy Spirit? What is the Holy Spirit's gift given to people who will repent and be baptized? What is it? Well, it's actually a multitude of things. It's not just one thing. It's a multitude of things that are given to us. For instance, what is the Holy Spirit's gift when one repents and is baptized for the remission of their sins? Well, one thing is fellowship. Fellowship with God. Fellowship with those who are also right in the sight of God. You look over in 2 John verse 9. In 2 John verse 9, he tells us, that whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ hath both the Father and the Son. If we abide in the doctrine, he says, we have both the Father and the Son. First John chapter 1 says that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. So I see fellowship from two sides. There's a fellowship I can, can enjoy and I can, can, can experience from me to God, God to me. That's fellowship, 2 John 9. Furthermore, there's a fellowship I can experience with everyone else that has fellowship with God, 1 John chapter 1. And so I have fellowship and sharing and participation together, this special relationship with God. And because I have that relationship with God, then I have a relationship with everyone else on earth that also has that same relationship. And so, yes, this is part of the gift. Because if I'm not a Christian, if I'm not a child of God, number one, I don't have fellowship with God. Number two, I do not have fellowship with anyone on earth that has fellowship with God. So I have lost, or I just, I just never had that fellowship with God if I'm not a saved person. But I can have it whenever I am saved from my sins 
and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Not only this, we have the, the gift, the spiritual gift of being added to the Lord's church. Acts 2 verse 47. Acts 2 47 tells us that they're praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Can I take a moment just to remind folks that whenever you're saved from your sins, you don't have to be voted in by somebody. You don't have to be voted in, ask permission, give your experience, give something else, and have try to convince people that they ought to accept you. Acts 2.47 says that whenever one will follow the Lord's plan of salvation in faith, repentance, and baptism, the Lord adds you to His church. See the point? That is a spiritual gift because there's no man that can add you to the Lord's church. The Lord adds people to His church. And He does this for all the saved people, doesn't He? He adds all the saved people to His church and He adds none of the unsaved people to His church. And that's the truth. And so if I am in His church, the Lord added me to His church, it means there's a spiritual gift I have received because there's no man that can put me in but the Lord puts me in to His church. That's what we find. Again, we talk about the spiritual blessings of being in Christ. Think about this. Over in the book of Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8 and verses 16 and 17, I see another blessing. I see another gift given here by the Holy Spirit when He says this. In Romans 8 verse 16, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. You want to be an heir of God? An heir of God, folks, that is a gift of the Holy Spirit. That's what has been given to us. We are blessed with that whenever we are saved from our sins. That's what you get. That's what it belongs to you. That's what you receive as the Holy Spirit's gift. You receive fellowship. We receive a name. We receive uh, being added to the Lord's church, and we receive the heir, the heirship, if you will, the inheritance. We're belonging to the family of God. We get that. That's ours for the, for the possession. I'll tell you something else. The Bible just is, is full of these things. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 that if any man be in Christ, well, you're baptized into Christ and put on Christ. So, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. If you're a Christian, you, have, you are a new, N-E-W, a new creature. New. All the things you did in the past are passed away. Whatever you've done in the past, you're forgiven of. Those things were washed away, wiped away. It's a clean slate. And you can start over. This is your do-over in life. This is your chance. This is your opportunity. And whenever you're in Christ, you are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Those are the things given by the Holy Spirit. Titus 1 and verse 2. We want to go on? Titus 1 and verse 2. The hope of heaven. Titus 1 and verse 2 speaks of this hope in heaven that is promised to those who are His. That's yours now. You're a Christian, that's yours now. Because you believed on Christ, you repented of your sins and was baptized. Because that happened, guess what? Here's your fellowship. Here's your new name. Here's your uh, added to the church. You're being added. Here is the heir, the inheritance that belongs to you. Here is the fact you can be a new creature and start over again. A hope of heaven. Here, 1 Peter 3 is another passage. You're the fact you can, yes you can, you can be heard by God. In 1 Peter 3, in verse 10, down through verse 12, it says, If any man will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lip that, that they speak no God. He says, Let him eschew or shun evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Why do those things? Why act in that way? Why should we do it? Why is this important to us? Why ought we act this way? Well, look over 1 Peter 3 and verse 12, and you'll see the reason why. He says this, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and His ears are open to their prayers. But, he says, the faith of the Lord is against them that do evil. So he says, the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. His ears are open to their 
prayer. You want to pray to God and have the confidence God is listening? You want to pray to God and having the confidence and the trust and the faith and to know that the God of heaven, that the ears of heaven are open to you, you need to be a Christian. The ears of heaven open to you is a result of that Holy Spirit's gift. Oh, how many wonderful things. Being able to develop a spiritual mindset. Romans 8 and verse 6 says, To be carnally minded is death. Be spiritually minded is life and peace. There is being spiritually minded. There is your life. There is your peace. And you can have it. It's yours. If you'll receive the Holy Spirit's gift. And on and on that go. The weapons of our warfare. Being able to fight Satan. Being able to stand in that spiritual battle. And in that spiritual fight of Ephesians chapter 6 says, in verses 10 through 18, to put on the whole armor of God. That is a spiritual blessing. That is a gift of the Holy Spirit. See it? Oh, so many wonderful things. Beautiful things. And finally, somebody says, how have you loved us, God? God said, I love you so much, I made a way for you to grow closer to me and to prepare you for heaven. That's how I loved you. So that one day, the ultimate, a home in heaven. Yes, my friends, that's the final destination for a Christian. The final destination for a child of God is to go to heaven one day, a place where we shall ever be with the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. A place where God is, a place where Christ and the Holy Spirit and the angels and all the blessed and all the redeemed of all ages will be there in heaven one day in eternity. And you can be there and I can be there if we'll just do what the Lord says. If we'll just follow the Lord's plan of salvation, we can have that where all the tears are wiped away and all those things are gone and live in bliss and rest, Hebrews 4 verse 13, and, and, and peace and all of that. Oh, how wonderful. And here's the Lord. Here are people ask the Lord. Say, Lord, how have you loved us? How have you done this? God said, I love you so much that I've wanted you to be in heaven with me. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 tells us that the Lord is not slack concerning His promises. Some men count slackness, but His long suffering toward us. We're not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. All, A-O-L, all should come to repentance. That includes you, and that includes me. And we can all come to repentance. We can all be right with God. We can all go to heaven one day if we just do what He says. Yes, I know life can be frustrating and hard, and there's hard things that happen to us, difficulties and problems in life, but whenever we look to God, we see a God of love. And God who loves us so much, He's given us all these many great and wonderful things. Let's never take those for granted. So thankful for this time and thankful for our study. I hope this has been a benefit to you. It's so exciting when we get to study and learn from God's Word in it. So thankful for this and, and so thankful for this opportunity. And until next time, we'll bid you good day. You've been watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs. Tune in each week as we study God's Word together on Monday at 9 p.m., Wednesday at 5 p.m., or Thursday at 11 p.m. The Ancient Landmark has been brought to you by Southside Church of Christ at 2920 New Hartford Road, Hornsboro, Kentucky, 42303.